would be forgiven for thinking, of course, if you studied our wonderful British monarchy, that they seem rather friendless. And more importantly, of course, don't seem to develop much friendship or personal relationships with those that work for them. If you give the plethora of books behind all of these ex-royal servants, helpers, whatever you want to call them, they're already at the drop of a hat to reveal singly every single thing about working with their royal life. The counter side to that, of course, is many people might suggest it's not a highly paid position within the royal household, and it isn't. But what you can get, of course, is escalate your career to the higher echelons, particularly if you've been a footman, butler, that type of thing. You get the picture. But how does it work on a normal level, day-to-day -day friendships with, of course, senior members of the British monarchy? Today I wanted to bring you a story about a friendship that a, a lady from America who really did so much for us over here in the United Kingdom, particularly during the Second World War. Something, of course, that was very dear to the heart of the then Queen, Queen Elizabeth, of course, later known as the Queen Mother for my generation. The sort of person that we saw all the time at those wonderful royal variety performances. And I often say, don't I, that you could tell she thoroughly enjoyed those events. Not everybody does, let me tell you. But of course, the Queen Mother, as she was known, loved going to those uh, performances because she was seeing a lot of things that she'd seen possibly during the war and on film, and she remained incredibly starstruck. But it was this particular relationship that was formed way back in the 1920s at the Winter Garden Theatre in the very heart of London that proved to be one of her longest lasting. And the influence they, she had not just on the then Queen, but also on the princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. Let me explain. Nice to see you today, Nazella. Thank you so much for joining me. It is fascinating when you find these things out, particularly when you meet and interview people that have lived through it, you know. The late Queen Mother, in many respects, gets a bad rap, seemingly because there are two sides to her. The one that are protecting the monarchy through those very difficult times, as one can imagine with the Wallace Simpson and Edward debacle that she had to fight tooth and nail for to make sure everything remained a steady ship, or else we wouldn't have what we have today. It's all part of history. But way back in the 1920s, this beautiful lady from Missouri, Kansas, Dorothy Dickinson, well basically, well, she was a huge star. Literally came over to London after appearing uh, on various stages across the United States and also in a few silent films. She could have become one of those iconic people, but it was a twist of fate that literally changed the direction of her life. Over here, she became famous for that track, Look for the Silver Lining, from that said musical. And in the audience at the Winter Garden that night was none other than the Queen Elizabeth. Now, very quickly, she went backstage to, you know, say what a wonderful performance, all of that sort of stuff. And instantly, these two ladies clicked. I mean, clicked on a huge level. And they liked each other's company. And very quickly, the Queen invited her over to Buckingham Palace for tea and a chat. Like all ladies of that generation, they were interested in dresses, fashion, gossip, and of course, talking about the things that perhaps should remain behind closed doors. You know what it's like. But Dorothy was much more than that. She was very well connected in the theatrical world, appearing in things like Ivan Novello musicals, a very much respected composer, actor, director, all sorts of things of his generation, totally unique. Instantly, of course, all of these people got introduced with inside the royal monarchy. And this is really what cemented that very good friendship with the late Queen Mother and none other than Sir Noel Coward. Now, Noel Coward, if you recall, had a bust unveiled of him at the Theatre Royal Jewelry Lane by none other than the Queen Mother. Yes, that's how friendly they were. But back to Dorothy. Well, you see, Dorothy, as I say, had come over here, and the bottom line was it, she'd really made it her home herself. And the Queen and her became very chummy. So much so that it was Dorothy that taught our late Queen, Princess Elizabeth, and Princess Margaret how to dance. Not only that, she gave expert tuition to the Queen all about makeup, particularly if you weren't facing the glare of the camera, how you needed to apply more makeup just to make sure that your face isn't lost in the lens, as she called it. Also about fashion, tips, deportment. You see, what the Queen Mother at that time wanted was to become more relatable, more accessible to the general public. And Dorothy was indeed the ideal person.
Now fast forward, of course, during the Second World War, she was also instrumental in instigating the opening of the stage door canteen in the very heart of Piccadilly. And behind the scenes, the Queen Mother, or Queen as she was then, was doing a lot to assist also by sending down vegetables, all sorts of things from the palace kitchens for all of those wonderful GIs that were assisting us during the Second World War. But Dorothy said, look, it's very nice, you know, Elizabeth, but what they really like are things like this, meaning donuts. So very discreetly, very quietly, lots of donuts were made inside the palace kitchen and discreetly sent down. Nobody knew where they were coming from, of course, other than Dorothy and Queen Elizabeth. Now, it's fascinating to think, isn't it, when you look at it back now and you think, wow, both of these ladies remained super tight friends throughout their lives. Dorothy, of course, had a daughter who went on to marry the sublime actor, Anthony Quayle, keeping everything, of course, in the world of show business. She lasted until the wonderful old age of 102. No mean feat, of course, as a friend <laughs> almost made it herself. As I say, when you look behind the scenes, it's always fascinating to note, isn't it, whether royals do make really super tight friendships. You know, do they have friends outside palace walls? Dorothy remained a very good friend, never revealing, never, of course, telling outsider gossip to anyone. She was offered a lot of money, as one could imagine, for her story. But as she said, an old showgirl truly never dies. You remain tight-lipped and more importantly, you make sure to keep your friends very safe. She certainly did that and of course the Queen Mother really did rely on her throughout her life, not just for fashion and makeup tips, but for really good sage value and of course close friendship, confiding in her about things that she possibly didn't want to worry the Queen with or indeed her daughter Princess Margaret. It's always nice, isn't it? We often think we've found everything that we know about the British royal family. And I have to thank this particular individual, Terry, for his reminiscences about this particular story. He was there, he lived it, and boy, what a story he's got to tell. Neil Sean in the very heart of London.